This video is going to cover growing uh, your own data. It's, it's a very sensitive topic. I made one of these videos and then I, I went and deleted it uh, because it's, it's a very, very sensitive subject. But I decided to make another video because uh, of the need for this subject matter. It's probably one of the most important videos that you'll watch on this channel or listen to. And here's why. Um, data is something that is uh, in scarce supply in the healthcare market. It's fiercely protected by uh, payers, no matter who you're talking about, you know, government or state or commercial, doesn't matter. They protect their data and there's all kinds of contracts in place. And so getting a hold of some of the data can be a very, a very tricky thing to do. Uh, for purposes of this video, I want to be uh, explicitly clear that we're talking about synthetic data and how to grow your synthetic data, not about taking some data away from a payer, for example. Okay. Uh, and there's also uh, schools of thought around this, which uh, if there's anyone out there that really understands the subject matter, uh, in one camp, uh, there are people that will swear by raw data. Uh, and I understand why they do it, too, because, um, you know, they don't trust someone that's going to create uh, synthetic data. And I get it because, no offense, but most of the folks out there don't have a clue on how to do this anyway. And if they did, they would just really hack it up. And believe it or not, you know, translators are available for anyone who wants to create synthetic data. And some of them just simply don't use them. Uh, and also a, a legitimate EDI SME is in very rare supply in this market. Um, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. It's, it's a pain point for me. Uh, many folks will run a translator like EdFX Spec Builder, for example, and they'll, and they'll tell the payer or developer group that, hey, I'm an expert with EDI. And, and then if they were asked to draw up uh, an 837 from scratch with a piece of paper and a pen, then they would be lost. So you, what I'm trying to say here is that data is very difficult to come by and it has been ignored to the point where it's almost like prohibition, you know, where you have uh, all of this data uh, or the need for data, uh, but none is available. So let me go over some points here on why you need to grow your own data farm, why it's critical in this industry. Number one, for testing. Um, you can't test anything that you're developing if you don't have real data. Um, this, uh, this video is going to imply that you need the services of a data farm or someone that knows how to grow one. And uh, the Remore Bay Company is absolutely uh, experts at creating synthetic data. We have translators uh, and editors, and we have uh, guru-level EDI SMEs out here. Uh, we'll pit those against anyone that you'll find on any, any of your major translator companies. And I say that, you know, I'm repeating myself because uh, if you work as a payer and you've worked with uh, any of the big EDI translator companies, you'll know, and I've been doing this for 30 years, that um, just because you've hired a name brand EDI translator adjudication system doesn't mean that you're going to get folks that really know what the data looks like. Uh, and, and that's a whole nother video right there. But um, if you don't have data, decent data, then you can't do legitimate real world testing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are a couple different camps. Some people think that uh, you should only use raw data, but you'll run a million claims to try to get maybe a couple examples. But if you just use uh, an EDI SME that knows what they're doing, you don't need that. 
you can create better results with synthetic data than you ever could with raw data. And the only reason why anyone would consider raw data is simply because they've been burned by folks that said that they were EDI experts and they weren't. Uh, I am uh, a leading EDI expert in this industry and I can tell you with confidence that uh, I can create you better examples synthetically I don't need to to look at data, for example, from from a payer. I've been looking at data from payers for 30 years. Uh, and uh, I also came from a development background and um, still have my uh, one foot in development and other in, in uh, business analysis. So uh, you, you need data for testing. Uh, one of the second reasons that you'll need data uh, is for sales uh, and marketing. Um, this is really critical. If, if you have spent, you know, thousands or more developing an application, most of the folks on this channel are developers who already have a provider. And so they've already made the sale as it were, but they're hoping to, to sell their application or software service to others. But to do that, they're going to look pretty silly if they go in front of a, a payer, and we're talking about a million dollar sale, et cetera, and you end up with data that looks like Toys R Us. Okay? Uh, you know, this is just a critical need. Uh, uh, also, underneath this, um, there's also the question about volume data. Uh, the Roman Moore Bay Company has several apps where, for example, if you wanted to do volume testing, we can create 10, 20, 30,000, 100,000 claims just like that. You know, you know, we can take we can even take a seed claim from from yours and duplicate it for you for volume data. Uh, volume data will make you look very, very good in front of a payer. But if you start uh, doing your sales and marketing, and all you have uh, is just a couple claims, they're going to start wondering about your legitimacy. So, uh, you know, data, uh, I'll say uh, a decent amount, will, will add to your legitimacy, okay? Uh, the next uh, point I want to point out is, um, for example, the, the providers. Uh, how should I put this? I'll actually call this billing agencies. They tend to hide the data. What do I mean by that? Um, if you're a provider and you say, hey, I want to look at my data, uh, some of those will not make that available to you. It could be written in their contract, for example. And the reason why they do that is that uh, if you have the data, like, you know, we're talking, for example, um, data like uh, both the 837 and the 835, that's your payment, uh, your invoice, and your, or your 837 claim and your 835 remittance. If you have both of those, then you could actually go to another vendor and have them test it. And billing agencies know that they don't want to be audited. And that, you know, I've run into providers, even on this channel, who can't get their data. So if they're trying to develop a way out of uh, the situation they're in, the billing agencies don't want to let go of it. And so, you know, they hold on to it. And they won't let anybody get a hold of it. Uh, the fourth reason why data is so critical uh, is around uh, the, the payer group, okay? They really pretty much have a moratorium on data. That means you can't get it. It's almost like prohibition. You know, there's just, you're not going to get any data. Uh, they lock it up and there are all kinds of contracts where you can't get a hold of it. These are all reasons 
why uh, synthetic data is critical. Uh, and when I say synthetic data, I mean quality synthetic data. Um, out there in the market, uh, there's just um, it's just not available. It's one of the one of the key aspects at Remora Bay that we can create synthetic data. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not necessarily cheap. You know, because uh, there's a lot of work that we that we uh, that we put into the synthetic data. It has to be, for example, created by a true EDI SME, given the parameters. I should probably list these out. Uh, these are some of the details that have to go in uh, to creating quality EDI synthetic data. Uh, one is EDI SME research. Given your parameters, okay. The second thing is uh, validation. Run through uh, one or more translators, and then uh, duplication. You know, um, you know, you know. When I say duplication. Uh, this also uh, involves, for example, uh, random generators. Um, you could, for example, you could order random dates, amounts, even ID, uh, even uh, ID numbers or example names. Um, when I say example names, I mean, you know, this is something, uh, uh, you know, with confidential. I'm going to say, put that on the next line. Uh, with confidential uh, agreement, and uh, that's uh, that actually touches on one of our other videos. A confidential agreement means that uh, you agree not to sell or distribute the data that uh, we're using between us. It does not mean. Uh, uh, an invention clause, you know, where uh, just because we're in the same industry that you start uh, presuming that you own software technology, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of the reasons why uh, EDI data is so expensive to come by or it's so difficult to come by. It's because um, it's critical to use it in testing. Uh, it's an absolute must in sales and marketing. Um, Bill, billing agencies can hide this data from you, and payers have a moratorium on this. Okay. Um, also, um, if you're an offshore team, you know uh, how critical it is that no data can be moved offshore. But if you're creating synthetic data, and for example, it, you can even use um, safe harbor techniques or uh, for example, no PHI data, which is primarily what we use. Uh, so a name field, for example, would say uh, NM1, you know, asterisk IL, asterisk 1, asterisk last name. It would literally say last name. It would look like this, for example. NM1, asterisk IL, asterisk 1, asterisk last, asterisk first. Okay, I want to make sure I got this right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it might look like that, for example. Okay, now that's generally what we like to use. But um, the details that you'll find are going to include uh, 
information that's important to you, and that might mean uh, um, diagnosis codes, ICD-10, ICD for example, or CPT HixPix codes, you know, at the um, service line. custom amounts and volumes and you might have some particular particular needs so um, this video is really uh, making you aware uh, of the critical nature of data and why it's important to grow your own data um, I mentioned here data farms but uh, you know, Remora Bay uh, is a data farm. We grow data, uh, quality data. I don't know of anyone else in the industry that does it. It's taboo. Payers are afraid that, you know, that their data is going to be stolen. And, uh, you know, don't even talk about it. You know, it's just like um, something that's not going to happen. But it's something that's critical. If there's going to be advan advancements or development in this industry, and you don't have data, how are you going to do that? You know, somebody has to step up to the plate and say, we are legitimate data farm. Okay? Uh, that, you know, that doesn't mean that we're using payer data. That's raw data. What I'm talking about here is synthetic data that we have created. It's kind of like if you take your car to uh, get an oil change, and they ask you, do you want, you know, raw oil or regular oil or synthetic? What do you do? You say, well, I want the synthetic data because, you know, it's been processed a lot more at a higher degree. It's exactly the same way with synthetic data. It's a much higher quality data. It's been tested. Raw data is not tested at all. You know, it, it could be downright garbage. And most of it is. And unfortunately, there's no productive um, you know, diversity in there. In other words, if you get raw data and it's got errors in it, there's nothing for you to learn. You know, if especially if those errors are quirky errors. Some errors you could actually learn from. A lot of them is, are a waste of your time. Why would you risk it? You know, you're wasting your team's time. You're wasting your payer's time. Wasting your time. You're wasting everybody's time. So you save a lot of time in getting some quality synthetic data. Um, so anyway, this will give you some points. It is by no means, uh, you know, um, all of the points. At, uh, at the Remora Bay Company, uh, we own our own claim adjudication system. And I, I think that will help you to understand how we can have a data farm here because uh, because of the fact that we have a legitimate claim adjudication system, it will automatically create uh, our own 835s, TA1 file rejections, 277CAs, etc. cetera, uh, the same way as any other claim processing system would. Uh, we do also uh, have that software for sale. Uh, it's... Uh, it's a very, very useful tool. Uh, if anyone is going through training or development, uh, this is this could also be used at, at the payer level. You know, if you wanted to add a new product line, uh, like for example, let's say you're a payer and you want to start adding in adult daycare services. Why not, why not just start with a cat claim adjudication system? You know, this takes minimum personnel to run. Instead of having 50 people and $50 million to do claim processing, you can add another line to your payer model. Really, this is really a whole business model there. You could approach payers, and that could be your sales pitch right there. Uh, I know I've been doing this for, like I said, 30 years, and $50 million to process claims for payers, it's low. Um, usually, they start at about $75 million and go up. And those that say that they can do it for $50 million are, are really probably not being honest. Um, uh, what they'll do is they'll start that, and then they'll start a process that says, well, it, the scope looks to be bigger, and they'll do that on purpose just so they can win the contract. Um, 
that really leads into a whole nother topic uh, that I could go into and uh, I'm just going to mention here, it here lightly and that is that there's a void in the payer market right here around EDI data and it's going to catch them if it hasn't already uh, because if there's a problem or a dispute over a claim and someone were to say okay I'm going to um, you know, I'm going to request or demand that I get a hold of my claim processing. You know, who at the payer side is going to actually know what the ADI looks like, where to get it, or whether or not it's even legitimate? I know that sounds crazy, but I've worked for payers my whole life. And, um, you know, they're not experts on EDI. They're not. They, they have folks that are expert on the business side. They typically will farm this out, and then the payers will leave themselves wide open for someone to attack them at the data level. In other words, if you were to demand, hey, you're asking me to pay this claim, I want to see your 837 to see if it was legitimate. And they probably don't want that, because if it was found out that their data was non-compliant, uh-oh, you see where I'm going with this? I'm going to stop right there, okay? It's a real issue. You know, you ignore the EDI SME and you make yourself very, very weak in this section. Um, and it's also why payers can get shoved around sometimes by provider groups simply because there's no one there that uh, that is a true EDI SME that knows how to defend the payer. And the payers can end up losing millions of dollars uh, because uh, there is a plethora of the developers out there that will stand on their soapbox and scream out, this is the way it is. And it's, it could be terribly wrong. Listen, let me, let me give you an example. I think I've given this example before. I'll mention it again. I was at a real payer here in the United States. And they just decided that HIPAA EDI didn't work for them. This is a fact, folks. A fact, not a story. A real fact. So they just started, instead of doing 837s or 835s, stuff like that, they just started using XML because, you know, somebody bold in that payer group decided that they didn't need it. And that went on for a few years. And I think 60% of, uh, it's either 40 or 60%, I think it was 60% of the payer, uh, the providers, had lined up and there, all kinds of the developers had jumped on the bandwagon and started developing XML. And they were using XML to EDI. And it's, until someone came up and said, now you're in serious trouble with the federal government. And that's how far lost they were. And, um, and, and I think that this void is even greater now with this pandemic. There's a great ignorance around uh, EDI and it's a weakness. Uh, so it, it's imperative if you're going to start off this year or you have uh, plans for the future, you need to understand what's right and what's wrong at the data level. Because here's the big assumption. Everyone wants to solve the EDI problems after they get inside the system. The big assumption is that the data, like 837 data or 270 data, for, for example, eligibility or enrollment, whatever, they want to assume that that data is clean going in. Or they simply don't want to pay for the support. Payers don't like paying for support, so they just take dirty data and they don't make a big fuss about it. But if they're ever called into the carpet, then uh, you know they find out that they're non-compliant and uh, they're they're mandated to be compliant. Then all of a sudden, there's a big issue, and and that's also the point of all sorts of litigation. So. Um, this video is really to uh, stand up the importance of data in this market. Uh, and it's also uh, one of the things that we offer at the Remora Bay Company. If you need some synthetic data, you want us to grow your data farm for you, uh, let us know. We're experts at this. We can give you quality data. We can give you data that's been validated in one or more translators. So we're talking about good, clean data that uh, you can use for whatever your application, and, and we can even customize it as well. 
Uh, but if you are, are unsure about anything, we do have all kinds of standard data which we have created and we own. And I'm not talking about, you know, passing raw data. I'm talking about creating synthetic data. And as I mentioned, you know, we have our own adjudication system and even our own wonderful transaction manager, Silo Bay, uh, that will help us index and find anything uh, immediately. We have one Medicaid plan that was using Silo Bay and, and uh the lookup time on that was so much faster. Uh, I, I would say, you know, 50 times faster with Silo Bay than the regular translator. Or that's also another problem with uh, claim adjudication systems there. They focus on creating the data, but when it comes to actually managing the files, it's a nightmare. Uh, and if, if you're out there, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, anyway, this is... Uh, this is the data or the, the video for covering data. It's uh, probably the most critical, important and important uh, video that I've made uh, this whole year or this past year in 2020. And it's 2021 now. But um, I thought that it was important to mention this going forward so that uh, if companies are out there wanting to grow and, and you should be, you know, doubling down your efforts to make sure that uh, you're ready to prosper, you know, after or past this pandemic. This is one of the key areas that you need to be focusing on. If you have any questions, you can send me uh, a question to edi.dallas at zoho.com or you can leave me a comment below and let's get going on that data farm. Thanks.